This is my 155th day. After today, I've only got 24 days left. And uh, as I said, about five of them are going to be devoted to German. And I realized that uh, I'm going to be leaving on a trip for Europe, a 20, 19, 20 day trip to Europe in less than 25 days of teaching, uh, May 13th. So uh, I'll have to finish the course after I come back, which just dawned on me. I thought I could finish it before I'd go. But that, that's fine. That's maybe even better because I'll, I'll be a changed person, no doubt, after that trip to Europe. Um, all right. Uh, going back just a little bit, the 17th century, I failed to mention the Dutch school of painters, and I should have. Uh, my orientation has been literature, or language, not so much literature, but language. And uh, so Shakespeare writing his plays, that to me is where the excitement is. But, and I don't think, of, I'm certainly not an artist. And I don't even know if I'm a very much of an art appreciator. But here is some art that I appreciate a lot. Um, uh, the Dutch School of Painters, uh, painting at about the same time that Shakespeare was writing his plays. Maybe, well, maybe just a little bit later. Uh, Rembrandt, you've surely heard of him. Franz Hals is another one, and there were many, many more. Uh, uh, in Amsterdam, if you ever go to Amsterdam, you'll have lots of things to see and do besides what I'm going to tell you. But I've been to Amsterdam, I think, twice. And what I think I liked most of all was the Rijksmuseum. There is a museum in Amsterdam that has a fabulous collection, not only of the Dutch School of Painters, but also of, of furniture and that. So I'm tipping my hat to a certain museum in Amsterdam. It's wonderful. Now, you hear that? Those are barn swallows, and they have arrived. So they're zooming around in here like fighter pilots. Uh, they're my favorite bird, I think. They, they came, I thought they came on April 15th, but my wife said she saw them a couple days before. But they're going to be living in here now until August, and uh, you're going to hear them. It's going to be like having a noisy audience, because uh, I actually made places for them to build their nests. I'll show you later on, but you're going to hear that in the background a lot. This is a barn, after all. Uh, all right, well, the 18th century, um, the classics. Um, well, uh, I'm going to start with literature, um, and now we had a reading public. By this time, there were enough people that could read and printing technology had come far enough along that it was reasonable to write a book for people to for people to read for pleasure. Uh, so we get we get our first novels. Uh, you know their purpose is entertainment, but it's to sit and read. You see, in Shakespeare's day, there weren't enough people that read, so he, he wrote plays. I mean, people sure they were into literature, but it was plays where they heard it uh, or poems that, that Chaucer would, would read, uh, or songs. But now we had novels, the first novels, and uh, two that I want to mention. First of all, Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe. Some people say it is the first novel. Mm, that's hard to argue that, but anyway, it's a very early novel. It's hard to read because the language is so old, but it continues to be a popular story. Uh, I was drawn to it first, I believe, by uh, a movie done, I think, in 1954, which I believe still remains the best, although it's been there's been remakes of it, like Castaway is a remake of it. But I think that was the best one. But then I read it. And nowadays, I think we read uh, that book having experienced romanticism. And it's, it's an adventure, and it's out in the world of nature. But all through the 18th century, when that was so popular, it was popular largely because it showed what people wanted to believe. That, that man, if he kept his reason, if he kept his mind, he could overcome nature. He could defeat nature. And Robinson Crusoe makes that island be a civilized place. And it's the gradual story of that. People love that story uh, for that next hundred years. Uh, Tom Jones is an English... Uh, Henry Fielding wrote this. Uh, boy, it would be hard to read. It's monstrously thick and it has such an odd style. I think I set out to read it once, but I gave up. I'm a slow reader. But happily, it was made into a wonderful movie, 1963, I think. Albert Finney starred as Tom Jones. Um, I highly recommend it. I would always show the opening of it to my students. And that's what I would recommend you find a way to do. It must be on YouTube. I, I didn't look. It opens as if it were a silent movie with a harpsichord playing, except it's in color. Uh, and I'll say to the kids, what instrument is that? 
And sometimes they'll know it's a harpsichord. See, pianos had not yet been invented in, in the 18th century. Uh, well, the archetype, the archetypic character of a rogue hero, that's what Tom Jones is. He's, he's bad, but you love him. Uh, uh, his problem is he's so handsome that the women just won't leave him alone. He's always in trouble. Uh, a rogue hero. Uh, I, I take this as an excuse to launch into a discussion of what other rogue heroes are there. Uh, Long John Silver, I think, would qualify as a rogue hero. He's bad, but you like him. You're glad when he gets away in Treasure Island. Uh, modern day, Al Bundy. If you've ever seen uh, Married with Children, Al Bundy is such a good example of a rogue hero. There were a couple of characters, uh, Beavis and Butthead, I think they're probably rogue heroes. Uh, it, it, you know, a no good, no good, but you like them anyway. It's, it's quite a quite a pop. In, in the in the movie Willow, uh, Mad Mardigan is a rogue hero. Han Solo in Star Trek is a rogue hero. He has no interest in being a hero. He, he's a rascal, but you love him. Well, anyway, Tom Jones, I highly recommend. I recommend that movie. You should simply watch that whole movie. I'd once heard this described as the most perfectly plotted uh, story ever written. I don't know about that, I can't judge that, but it, it's, it's a wonderful movie. Uh, first periodicals. But, oh, and another thing about that one. I just like to use that clip, uh, clip of that to show the 18th century in the early part of it. That's early 18th century, maybe even late 17th century, to see the wigs. Uh, not quite as extreme as at the end. Well, we get our first periodicals, too. By that, I mean newspapers, magazines. And an example for Americans is Poor Richard's Almanac. Uh, I don't know if uh, anybody still reads Poor Richard's Almanac, but it was written by Ben Franklin. And Ben Franklin is the best example I can come up with of, a, of, a, of an 18th century man that people would basically know. A good example of an 18th century man, he was an inventor, uh, his mind never ceased. I mean, he was curious. He was wanting to figure things out. He wanted the Enlightenment. He was a printer, and you see printing uh, had, had taken off. Uh, a, a very interesting man. Uh, you know, one of the more interesting, I think, Americans. Uh, <clears throat> uh, first, first dictionary. I'm proud that Ben Frank was also from Pennsylvania. Boy, these barn swallows are happy to be here, I think. Uh, uh, first dictionaries, uh, yeah, that's, an, that's a logical, reasonable thing to do. This is the age of reason. Let's gather up all these words and let's agree on how we're going to spell them. Before the dictionaries, you could spell them any way you wanted to. There was no right or wrong. And let's say, what do they mean? Let's get this all organized. Well, Ben, uh, not Ben, Samuel Johnson, maybe, maybe there's no H there. Samuel Johnson's dictionary in England, in England is the first English dictionary, I think. Americans are very much aware of a guy named Webster, uh, Noah Webster's dictionary. But I make an arrow because ultimately the Oxford English dictionary, in a sense, it's like the climax of the genre, the OED. Uh, and I didn't bring it down because I just didn't want to take the time, but I have a copy in two volumes that's got four pages. <laughs> printed per page on really thin paper. It's called the compact edition, and it came with a, mic, uh, a magnifying lens. You had to use a magnifying lens to read it. Because, uh, but, and I think it cost $100 back in its day. But the Oxford English Dictionary was something like 17 volumes long. I think it took, I don't know if it took 25 years to write it. It's enormous. And they're putting it online. I go to it every so often, maybe about once a year, I'll have some reason to look something up, because it, just as an example, you look up the word go, G-O, and there are eight pages about the word go. It doesn't only tell what it means now, it means what it meant whenever, gives you contexts. It, it's unbelievably complete. Not of the 18th century, but in a sense that's the climax of the genre. First encyclopedias, well, Diderot's Encyclopedia of the Trades and Industry. Also, this is a very logical thing to do. Uh, sensible, reasonable. Let's get knowledge and let's organize it. Let's get it in alphabetical order. Let's do drawings. Let, let's make it widely known how people do things. Now, these are uh, 
I was living in Brazil when I got these. I ordered them from Brazil and I had them shipped when I found out that they were available. Uh, they're not the articles really, they're just the pictures. And, and I think I did show this to you earlier in the year. Uh, there's a spur maker. What Diderot did in Paris was he, he took his artists and went into shops and drew what, what the shops look like and what the, uh, what the uh, tools look like. Yeah, there, there's a tilt hammer. I actually want to build a tilt hammer. Um, um, anyway, uh, wonderful. Uh, and I, I go back to that more than once a year. And um, he was, Dennis Nero was, they tried to stop him. He was put in prison, if I'm not mistaken, to try to prevent him from publishing that book. That was revolutionary to do that. And I guess there was more reasons than just secretiveness of the trades. But by publishing that, basically anybody who bought it could get access to knowledge about how, like a glass factory. You could set up a glass factory if you read that article. It, you know, it's stuff that was, there were family secrets. Back in the Middle Ages, you, you didn't tell people what you knew. That was valued, it was treasured. And now it's get the word out. This is the age of enlightenment. And in many ways, uh, his encyclopedia contributed to the uh, uh, Industrial Revolution. Uh, Diderot's Encyclopedia of the Trades and Industry. Now it's in French. The original's in French. I know I told you about this because earlier in the year I read a sonnet of mine that I had composed after traveling to Washington, D.C. to see the original, a copy uh, 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 an original copy of, of the encyclopedia in the rare book room. Um, I go back to it often, and, and I can also tell you that after this class is over, this year's course is over, it's entirely possible, it's likely, that I'm going to teach other courses. I think I'll teach a course in German. I think I'll teach a course about mountains. And I think I'm going to teach a course about old ways of doing things. Uh, uh, but that's, that's just a preview of maybe... Uh, a coming attraction. Uh, the steam engine. Uh, well, it was in the uh, toward the end of the 18th century that it developed, and here we go into that industrial revolution. I mean, for the first time now, there was a, a source of, before the steam engine. Basically, there were three kinds of power: you had water power, you had wind power, or you had muscle power, either human or or animal muscle power. But now you could get power out of coal or wood, not just heat, but power. And with the steam engine begins this process of things getting really, really big. Now, there aren't that many steam engines around now. It, it, later on, I'll tell you more about that later. But there we kind of begin. And people still do like them, and, and they certainly got things started. Well, uh, I'll see you tomorrow.